in talking about the library building was to point to these products and say, you know, who among us 15 years ago could anticipate that these things were going to be on the market and one of the, you know, part of the toolkit that we have today. Uh, it's a dynamic, shifting landscape, uh, one that is uh, you know, difficult to, to uh, anticipate fully. Last summer, uh, August of, of 2011, there was a satellite workshop, a, a pre-conference, to the annual conference of the International Federation of Library Associations, the gist of which was to identify you know, what makes for a 21st century library. I had the opportunity to be one of the, the program planners for that, that conference, and as we were pulling together the, the, the program, you know, it, we started talking in terms of, well, you know, we're 10 years into the 21st century. We've been designing, allegedly, we've been designing 21st century libraries for 10 years now, uh, and you know, many of the libraries that have been open during that period, you know, designated as 21st century libraries, looked an awful lot like 20th century libraries with a new dust jacket. So, so we wanted, uh, those of us who were active in IFLA and interested in, in library buildings, we wanted to try and, and probe what some of the distinctions are. This slide uh, is kind of my summary of some of the key distinctions that are starting to emerge uh, in library service and library facilities you know, as we move out of the 20th century into the 21st century, we come, we're coming from a, a, a tradition, a heritage that I would label as collection-centric, moving toward a, a, a philosophy or a, a, an approach that is user-centric. Uh, in the 20th century, libraries were characterized by permanence and stability. You know, think of a Carnegie Library and the statement it makes. Uh, for the community it's in. Permanent stability. Well, you know, today we're, we're just as likely, we're more likely to be interested in transience, flexibility, adaptability. Uh, you know, a couple generations ago, you know, I think typical service models involved working with individuals, individuals coming to use the library. Increasingly today, we're seeing groups using the library. We're seeing groups uh, interested in working together in different, uh, in different settings. Uh, 20th century, libraries were uh, characterized by quiet and reflectiveness. You know, when I, was, when I was this big and going to my branch library back home, <laughs> well, you know, today's library is a lot noisier. You know, there's a lot more going on. There's bustle. You know, we got, you know, we got the, the computers here, and there are printers, and they clack and beep and whir and all sorts of stuff. You know, the keystroke noises, all sorts of stuff going on. Perhaps the key distinction that I would draw is the very last pairing on this screen: collections and connections. <laughs> Uh, when I was working with Tupelo, Mississippi Library about a year and a half ago, we came up with the notion that the new Tupelo Library, uh, when it gets built, needs to be about connections and collections. And we deliberately put connections first over collections. Collections are important. Collections, I think, are going to, to be important for as long as we can uh, foresee things. Uh, but increasingly, libraries are about making connections. It's about making connections with the information that you see and that you have available in the collections. It's a, but it's also about making connections uh, with information that's available through electronic resources. It's about making connections with other individuals, whether it's the person who's sitting next to you here or the person who's on... You know, the other side of the world, making connections through emails and Skype and, and so forth. Uh, collections and connections are, uh, that, that really becomes the, the heart of libraries today. Here in Belleville, speaking about uh, this being a, a series of approximations to a moving target, as we mentioned earlier, we did a 2005 needs assessment based on what we surveyed in the landscape in 2005. You know, we made a series of, of service recommendations which eventually led to a recommendation that the library <coughs> have a building of 47,000 plus square feet. Well, since then, 
Again, the landscape has changed quite a bit. The 2010 census has been completed. That gives us you know, a newly updated forecast of the library's service population, arguably a more accurate one than the one we were using in the middle of you know, the last decennial census period. The library has converted to district status. As part of that conversion project, that the process, the library has made a commitment to opening a branch. So we're now talking about operating two facilities. How does that affect the distribution of services and the distribution of space needs. In the last seven years, new formats have been added to the library's, uh, to the library's collection. Uh, new content delivery strategies have become available. We're much more uh, familiar today with downloadable uh, formats and streaming formats and so on. Those things just weren't on, really weren't on the radar scope uh, seven years ago. You know, I'm thinking of another, another article in, that, that appeared in the Chicago Trib uh, maybe, maybe 10 years ago now. Um, and the article was about, was about how publishers back then were closing their e-book divisions left and right because the e-book divisions were not raking in the gazillions of dollars that they had expected. And the headline on the article back then read, e-books solve a problem most readers don't have. That was then, this is now. I mean, e-books have been with us for you know, a pretty fair period of time, 10 years plus, you know, but in their initial incarnation for a variety of reasons, you know, they didn't gain traction. Starting to gain traction these days, and they are one of, of several new delivery strategies, content delivery strategies that are available. Now, another important factor uh, is just the proliferation of, of mobile Access. You know, I'm seeing you know some the occasional smartphones here in the audience and some tablets and and so forth. You know, these things are, are critical changes that are you know on the radar scope today that weren't on the radar scope seven years ago. And you know, because of these changes, the library board has said, you know, let's come back and re-examine uh, some of our our service assumptions. The fundamental gospel that I've been preaching in my career as a library space planner is this, that services determine a library's space need. In the good old days, uh, one would, would estimate the, life, the space needs of a public library by applying a standard that was issued by maybe the American Library Association or the Michigan Library Association or the, the Library of Michigan. I don't think that did the... Was there uh, ever a standard for facilities in Michigan? I'm not aware that there was. It was specifically... There was a short time period when they... that they had a minimum. Okay. But it wasn't enforceable. <clears throat> okay. Okay. But they, they took that out of all the other things they were looking at. Yeah. They took the square footage out. Well, you know, again, it used to be that... Um, uh, you know, if, if you were working with the standard came from the, uh, from the American Library Association, well, that was 0.7 square feet. So if you were going to serve you know, 50,000 po uh, population, you needed a library of 35,000 square feet. Easy. Okay? Everyone can go home. Uh, there are two problems with that, with that assumption. Uh, one is that uh, different communities are going to have differing service needs. Every community that serves 50,000 population is not going to need the same set of collections and resources to meet the needs of, of its community. So there's a lot of variability out there that is not accounted for in one of those old standards. Uh, the other problem... What is the other problem? There's another problem. I lost track. <laughs> You'll get it. I'll get it. <laughs> Doesn't, doesn't include the services. Thank you. <clears throat> my, my stage manager down there. <laughs> the um, you know, all that tells us is, you know, the library needs a building of X square feet. Doesn't tell us anything of what's going into, uh, into that space. In fact, you know, the services that you want to provide do determine directly how big the library needs to be. I mean, you, you, know, you might look at reader seating, you know. Every one of these seats needs a certain amount of space, and you can quantify that space. 
You know, and there's a ballpark average, I'll tell you, that each reader seat in a library needs, you know, give or take 20 or 30 square feet. Some need a little bit more, some need a little bit less, depending on the particulars, but ballpark average 30 square feet. So if you wanted to provide 100 reader seats for your particular community, you would need to have about 3,000 square feet of floor space. Service goals translate directly into space needs. So, what we do is to look at the library's service needs in the context of seven different kinds of floor space. Floor space that most libraries, public libraries, academic libraries, school libraries, want to or need to be able to provide. The first kind of space is space for the collections. The books, the non-print, the, the, the uh, magazines, and so on. What kind of resource inventory do you want to provide for collections? And how does that translate into space needs? Second kind of space is space for public computing or, or patron computing. Uh, that's an increasingly critical part of the overall mix of the library's service uh, profile as more and more material is available electronically. We need to provide space for reader seating, just general open seating tables, lounge chairs, carols, and so on. Space that people can come in, occupy, and, and use the, the, the collections and resources of the library as they will. We need to provide for staff workspace. This includes public service desks. It includes back of house workroom space. I mean, there's an awful lot that goes on in, a, in, a, in any library that you know, the users really don't see much of. Circular, you, you, you interact with staff on the floor, at the desks, but you know, staff is also engaged in maintaining the collection, bringing new material into the collection, cataloging, processing, and so on, and then all of that goes on behind the scenes. We need to accommodate those activities to ensure that they are conducted uh, in the most effective, efficient way possible. Meeting and programming space is another critical element for most libraries. Uh, meeting space often occurs in three flavors. You might have a, uh, well, I'll say three and a half, because the room I'm in is, is a particular kind of example of, of meeting space. But most libraries will seek to provide some kind of multi-purpose, flat floor meeting space. We have a room like that in the, in the present library. You know, this might be viewed as a specialized kind of meeting room environment. Some libraries because of the nature of the programs that they want to offer, will choose to develop a room of this sort with you know, a raked floor and fixed seating and so on. It's a choice. Uh, other, other types of meeting space will often include a children's story time room or a more formal conference or board room space. You know, it's dominated by a table that you'll gather around and have uh, regular meetings. Special use space, let me say, I think the first five types of space are by and large self-explanatory. I mean, I can say collection space, and you have a pretty good idea of what collection space is. There's this other category of space that, that's called special use space that's meant to accommodate a variety of functions and services or inventories that many libraries want to provide, but that aren't directly accommodated in the first five types of space. The type of thing that might go into what we're calling special use space is you know, like a, a copying center. And a lot of libraries have photocopiers, for instance, and that's, that would be part of, of special use space. Some libraries will, will support an ATM. That would be part of special use space. Uh, there's, 